what a Savior when he comes yes king all his ransom home to lay then a new that song will sing hallelujah what a Savior That's good. Amen. Amen. There should yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. There should be a verse six. All right. All right. Uh, what page number is saved by the blood? Three hundred twenty-six, please. Three hundred twenty-six. All right. Amen. Thank you, sister. Thank you. <laughs> All right, 326. Here we go. Praise the Lord. We are saved by the blood. All right. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Now ransom from sin and the new earth begun. Sing. Brother Jonathan, would you 
give a word of prayer as we begin the long night of preaching and everything else so we could use some prayer. Thank you, Father. I just pray that, Father God, that uh, for those who are still coming, I pray that, Father God, that you will protect them, Lord. Please, Father, amen. Mercy, uh, uh, for your will, Lord, for them to get here safely, Lord. Uh, I just pray that, Father God, that you will bless this time, bless the uh, watch night service, Lord. As amen. We wrap up today. Uh, today's the last day of 2022. Yeah. Yes. Uh, help us, Lord, to glorify the last amen. day of this amen. year. Amen. And move on to next year and continue to serve and worship Yes, you, amen. And, and, and grow in your words and, and just yeah. be yeah. a blessing to each other and encouragement to each other. So I just pray to Father that you will bless anyone here today, Lord. So thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, you may be seated. It's like, you feel like running the bases when he prays. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. That was a good prayer. You got some of our boys stirred up. All right. So you men, uh, surprisingly, it was a little bit more than I thought. So uh, we're, I'm going to drop it to 12 minutes. Okay. So not 15, 12. So if that puts a real big... Uh, uh, you know, if it really uh, hurts you, so I'm really sorry, okay? <laughs> so we're going to go by 12 minutes, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to hear the popcorn preaching from beginning to end. Then we're going to do like a 10-minute break. And then after that, Hilton Smith will fire it away for us, all right? All right, amen. Okay, so 12 minutes, let us begin. Okay, brother Tom, you ready, brother? All right. Excuse me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. I guess then what I'll do is I'll leave it here for you. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you yeah. very much. You'll be okay. All right. The first one is the lame one. Amen. I have one not functioning arm, so <laughs> I'll be the lame preacher today. Let me start the timer here so I don't go off the time. All right. So we'll make it quick. I thought it was going to be 15 minutes, so I'm going to try to pack it in. All right. First of all, the title of my sermon is What's New? Pretty corny, but come on. Everyone has a habit of making New Year's resolutions, right? Everyone, everyone yeah. wants something new today. Everybody needs something more stimulating, something yeah. that's more, I guess, aggressive. I don't know. Yeah. Everybody wants something new, but have you considered what's new in your Bible? Because there are a lot of new things in your Bible. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's, let me just pray real quick. Heavenly Father, I, feel that, I pray that you'll please fill me up with the Holy Spirit, and I pray that you'll shove anything inside that will cause me to say anything that's against you. I pray that I'll only be a vessel, and I pray that you'll help these people today through this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. First of all, what's new in the Bible? Well, the New Testament is new. My first point is a New Testament. Amen. All right. God gave us a New Testament to show us how we're to live, how we're to minister, and how where to go in times when we need guidance. He gave us a New Testament. It makes me think like he gave it just for us. I mean, it's not just for us, but let me, let me just quote you something that I saw in Pastor Walker's book, okay? Pastor Walker notes in his book, Rightly Dividing the Bible. It's a great book. You should get it. It says, the New Testament has application to all people, those who believe in Christ now and has application to those in the future kingdom age called the Father's Kingdom in Matthew 26, 29. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, where does it say a New Testament? I know somebody's going to ask. Let's go to Matthew 26, 28, okay? Matthew 26, 28. You know what? After this, I'm just going to have to read the, the scriptures. I have a lot to go through. Okay. okay brother, go ahead. Matthew 26 and verse 28 says, oh, this is a long chapter. 26, 28 says here, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All right. Interesting point. For a testament to take place, the testator has to die. Hebrews 9, 6 said, Hebrews 9, 16, I'm sorry, says, for where a testament is, there, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Jesus Christ died so this New Testament can take effect for you. Amen. He died for all of us. Amen. That's something we should be shouting about. Amen. Yeah. I just, people are shouting in the back already. Yeah. Now, if, that was, if it wasn't enough for him to just come into our hearts as the comforter, as the Holy Spirit, he gave us a book. So yeah. he gave us something we can't see, and he gave us something yeah. we can see. Yeah. So he's filling up all our senses here. Praise the Lord, that's some good stuff, right? So thanks to this gift, we have, we have some great things to look forward to, and we should, we should treasure it and read it. 
Amen. That's an important thing. All right, my second point, a new destination. Somebody's going somebody to run. Okay, Ephesians 4, <laughs> verses 6, uh, sorry, Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this before you guys turn there, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Go but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are Woo! saved, hey! and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Amen. Jesus. Technically speaking, if you're saved, you're already there. So what else is new? You don't need anything else to be new. you got a new destination, amen? Before, when you were lost, you're going to a burning pit of, pit of fire filled with sulfur dioxide, and you're going to choke, and you're going to burn inside and out at the same time. But now you get to go up, seated next to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who made everything, and he promised to give you all things. Hey, that's a new destination to shout about, amen? Hey, if you're scared about where you're going next, you got to, at the end of it all, you're going to the better place. So don't worry about it. So in Revelation 26, I just want to put a, put a little uh, note here. Revelation 26 says, blessed, is, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be the priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. You have a new destination in the sense that you're going to heaven, but you're also going to be reigning here for a thousand years during the millennium. You, you see all these politicians, you don't like them? Well, you're going to be one, okay? You're going, to be, you're going to be a perfect one in the millennium, amen? It's going to be awesome, isn't it? You get to make things right. The Lord Jesus Christ gives you a chance to do some of the ruling, amen? You're, you're angry about what's going on today? Don't worry about it. You can fix it later. The Lord's going to fix it. Don't worry, okay? That's a good destination, amen? What's more? Hey, I know those of us in California can relate, okay? Or those of us in any big metropolitan area can relate to housing prices. Where am, I, where am I going with this? Somebody might, you guys might already know John 14, 2, okay? John 14, 2 versus, uh, John 14, 2 to 3 says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, to pre go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. God's not going to lie to you and say, hey, you got saved, but you can lose it so that you can't really go there anymore. No, no, no. He said, I've got a mansion for you. It's set up already. It's already been built, okay? And he's got the biggest one ever. Let me, look, if you're worried about housing prices now, don't worry. Because when you get up there, you're going to have a mansion bigger than any, any estate that a rich man has down here. And it's going to be made of gold, precious stones. I don't know what it's going to be made of, but it, I know it's going to be good, amen? That's what's new. All right. I need to go. Okay. Bear with me. It's going to get a little nerdy, but I have to share this with you. We're going to a place called New Jerusalem, okay? It's assuming that it's a double pyramid shape that Dr. Ruckman teaches. Let's see. The, the formula for the volume of a pyramid is length times width times height divided by three. You don't need to know that, but I just want to mention it. If you apply the dimensions that's mentioned in Revelation 21 to this, you have 12,000 furlongs, which is about, it was a lot of, uh, one furlong is about 200 something cubic meters, okay? Or meters. So if you multiply it twice, you get 9.38 times 10 to the 18th cubic meters, okay? Keep that in your mind for a second. The volume of all the water on earth is approximately 1.39 times 10 to the 18th cubic meters. When you divide the volume of New Jerusalem by the volume of all the water on this earth, it's 6.75 times greater and larger than all the volume of water on this earth. To give you, to give you some perspective, we don't inhabit much of this earth. Most people are crowded into very small spaces here. And if we can fit seven point something billion people here, can you imagine how many people we can fit in New Jerusalem? When the Lord said, you're gonna get a mansion, He's not talking about a dinky shack in Berkeley. He's talking about a mansion, amen? It's going to be a big one. He's not lying here. So don't you dare tell me a mansion is going to be something that you think is a mansion down here. It's going to be an estate, amen? There's plenty of room up there. You can look forward to that. All right. What, what else is new? A new friend, amen? When you get saved, you have a new friend in Jesus Christ. All right. When he, was on, when he was on the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ said in John 15, 15, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things have I heard of my Father, 
I have made known unto you. You realize that these things were written and we are reading these things, right? We're saved. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Therefore, by extension, we are also his friends because we're reading what he said, right? And we know exactly what he's going to do in the future. Yes. You are a friend of Jesus Christ. He is a friend to you. And he's a faithful friend that never fails because if you don't believe, yet he abideth faithful, the Bible says. <laughs> what a good friend, amen. You can backstab him all you want. He's not going to turn his back on you. He backstabbed him enough already this year, right? What's new? A clean slate is new. <laughs> a new, new year's coming up, so it's a clean slate, amen? <laughs> hey, good, good for us. <laughs> so, really cool thing. Our friend is so good, he, he does the exact thing he describes two verses behind in John 15, 13, where he says, Greater love hath no man than this, that he give, yeah. give his, lay down his life for his friends. He did that for us. Amen. He didn't even ask for a payment. He just did it for us because he wants to bring us up there together with him. What a good friend, amen. And better yet, he chose us first, not the other way around. He chose us. We just made the choice to get his gift, but he said, I want you first. That's a good friend, amen. All right, so in the new year, why not try to please our new friend, amen? Be a good friend to the Lord Jesus Christ. I know I have a lot of friends that I regret being friends with, but you know what? There's one that I never regret being friends with. That's the one up there that keeps me safe, amen? All right. Second and last point, a new name. We have a, what's new? We have a new name. Okay, I had to go back to Pastor Gene's teaching about this. If you want to learn more, go to Pastor Gene's video about Revelation 2.17. But uh, you remember the hymn, A New Name Written Down in Glory? You know, there's a new name written down in glory. Okay, I'm not going to sing it, but... See, the Bible says that God gave you a new name that nobody knows about. It's mysterious, right? Revelation 2.17 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit uh, saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give... Give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth of it. It's such a special name, the Lord doesn't tell anybody except you. Wow. I can't wait till I figure it out. It, I'm, I hope it's not good for nothing, you know? <laughs> I hope it's something good, amen? But I know it's going to be something good, because God never makes something that's bad, amen? Everything he makes is good. So it's... <laughs> well, all, all right... <laughs> We don't do that here, okay? Um, all right, so God not only saved you from hell, he gave you a new, he gave you a lot of things. I told you, he gave you a mansion, he gives you a new name, he's a friend to you, he gave you a comforter. What else can he do? He's, gonna, he's got a lot of good stuff for you. Next time somebody tells you there's no meaning in your life and, you know, you can just, you know, there's, there's no reason to try hard, we'll tell them, hey, God's got a meaning for me. Yes. He yes. named me with a special purpose, so I got to go and fulfill my purpose. So what, what should we do in the new year? We should strive to be the Christians that our new name might mean. You know, you don't know what our new name means, but why don't we aspire to be something good because our name probably means something good, amen? All right, next, last point. What's new? A new body. When you get to heaven, you get a new body. This bum arm's gonna get healed. My back's gonna get healed. My stomach's gonna get healed. Any of you suffering health problems, you're gonna get a new body. Let me tell you why. First, First Corinthians 5, 7 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're not the same as before when you were saved. You're a different creature. You're completely different. You feel bad about sinning. You feel bad about things that you're not supposed to do. You got a stronger conscience. You got a comforter. You're a new creature. I'll leave you off with this. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Notice how it's in the twinkling of an eye. It's coming. It's coming soon. All right, last one. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now, we are, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We don't know, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, I understand there's some ambiguities, but... I take it to believe we're going to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know how, but we will. Amen. So look forward to that. In the new year, let's try to be new Christians Whoa. described in the Bible, embodying these characteristics. Amen? Go. All right. Amen. Amen. All right. Next. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Next. Oh. <laughs> Proverbs 24, Proverbs 24. 
You look right at Hilton Smith, brother. Come on, man. Proverbs 24, verse 16. So, the Bible reads, For a just man falls seven times and riseth up again. Amen. But yes. the wicked shall fall in the mischief. Now, this is a very, very simple verse, but it's also a very encouraging verse. It is. It's Amen. not encouraging for people who are not know God, the heathen, right? But it's for us, for his children. Amen. And it's That's a right. verse that... and. Well, you got to say, there was a lot of precious promises that happened to you right there yes, that weren't sir. before. Before you were dead in trespasses and yeah. sins. Come but on, why would you guys say that completely changed? Yeah. You had all these things given to you at that moment. But also, a very encouraging thing, at least for me, that I think is the most encouraging is this verse. Because God knows you can get up. He knows that you can go through certain That's things good, and you can get yourself back up. Hey. You know, you meet a lot of people in your life that say that, you know, you can go through it, but then they kind of mock behind you, you know. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, no, he's not going to do it. He's going to fail. But God, he's like, no, he's not going to fail. Yeah. 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 I know he's not going to fail. Yeah. I know he'll, 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 he'll yeah. get back Praise up. The Lord. Yeah. Now, and it's interesting because the, the Bible says that uh, if that wicked man puts his hand on him, right, his, his, his dirty little hands, mm -hmm. he puts his hand on that just man, he's going to fall in mischief. Okay, and that was you too. Before you were, before you were saved, you were that wicked man. That if you touched a just man, that mischief would be upon you. But thank God you're not. Now, I want to be a blessing tonight, and thank you, Tom, for your. Where, where you went, Tom? Oh, oh. <laughs> thank you for your sermon, brother. Uh, I hope I'd be a blessing too. But uh, I'd like to remind you that yes, you failed over and over again in your walk. Yes, you have gone back up over and over again. And you've gone through temptation all the time. But just know that God will always be there for you. And he always gives you a way to get back up. There, he's ne he never abandons you. You abandon him, but he will never abandon you. And it may seem a never-ending cycle, but it will end. The cycle will end. Okay? God knows you can get the victory. He knows you can get the victory. So the top of my message is the fall and rise of the just. The fall and rise of the just. Uh, Lord, please uh, just bless the sermon. Lord, please calm my nerves right now, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, please be in the message, Lord. And thank you, God, for allowing us to be here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so my first point is the stumble that caused the just to fall. The stumble that caused the just to fall. Now, we all know that in order to fall, there has to be something that stumbles you. Yeah, okay? There has to be something where that caused that brief moment of hesitation that you fell. Mm -hmm. Whether it be the world or yourself, the devil, or someone in the church that caused you to fall. Yeah. It could be anything. Sure. It's that one hesitation, it completely breaks your fellowship with the Lord. Yeah. Now, there are many things that happen, and we try to mitigate in the church that we hope doesn't happen. Uh, but... Lord help us, there's one thing that does happen, and not only do we fail our father in this regard, we fail our pastor in regard if this happens. Yeah. Go to Romans 14. Romans 14. This is, sorry, if a church goes through this. If, a church ha if this happens to a church, it's, it's really disgraceful to God and also disgraceful to our pastor. Why? Because our pastor built up the church. Now, obviously, God puts his hand on the church. He puts on his, sure. his hand on the yeah. man. But the man has to be willing to build the church. Yeah. That's right. Romans 14, verse 7. Romans 14, verse 7, it reads, For none of us live to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, <clears throat> that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou uh, not thy brother? If we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now before you start telling me, oh, this is about meats. This is about food. <laughs> okay, all right, okay, you're more doctrine than me. Okay, I'll, I'll admit it. But can I ask you this one simple question? From when you got saved, okay, from that time that you, that moment, Till now, you're sitting here, you're enjoying the, the service. Amen. Have any in that period of time, have you caused somebody to fall in their faith? Oh. Were you that reason why they're out of the faith? Come on, brother. Oh. 
If that's the case, God help you because you're not going to like that at the judgment seat of Christ. Because wow. this is the thing I'm worried. Because if, that, if I did that, then this is what's going to happen. God's going to show me what that person could have done. Whoa, that's real good. He's like, hey, that's, that's he could have done this, he could have done that. He could have been a missionary. She could have been a pastor's wife. She could have been uh, able to do this for uh, the pastor's wife. But you decide just to stick them. Right. You decide to keep bugging at them. You decide to keep telling them how much they're not doing anything. And then finally, they're like, okay, I guess I'm not doing anything. I might as well leave. God help you if that's you. You know, I like it when we end the reach of the year. When we're at the end of the year, I like this time of the year. And you're probably like, oh, yeah, because I've done so well. I've done, I made this amount of money. I've done this amount of soul winning. I've done this amount of things for church. Matter of fact, at this point, you know, pastor relies on me so much to where I'm actually technically kind of the associate pastor. I'm actually the person <laughs> helping. I'm at this point where he really needs me more than I need him. So you see how sometimes get, people get a little twist with that? Oh, that's good. Yeah, amen. Come on, brother. Now, I know, yeah. <laughs> I'm coming out, brother, yeah. <laughs> Well, we have two different. <laughs> well, we have two. Well, we have two different ways of seeing it. For me, I think of how badly I messed up right. at the end of the year. I start looking at now. What you, what I uh, highly recommend you should do is uh, get a book and have like 365 pages in it, and every day write down what you did. Yep. Wow. And try to see how much good you've done for God and how much bad you've done. That's really You're going to be very scared how much wow. bad you've done versus how much good you've Whoa. done. Wow. Now, unless you're like, you know, even if you're at 50%, which I highly doubt anybody <laughs> at 50. But if you do, that's amazing. But let's be honest here. Unless you're like Paul or like back in the day when, you know, they were going through persecution um, and they're really close with the Lord. It's going to be nigh impossible for us to get to that point if we're so focused on our wow. phones, we're so yes. focused on things in this I'll world. You know, you can't, you can't possibly grow with God if you're stick with mammon. Yes. You, can't, you can't serve God and mammon. There has to be one. Either you despise oh one or you love the other. Yeah. you got to decide. You have to choose who you're going to serve. You can't Preach. serve two masters. Yes, sir. Now, God is going to take away this flesh one day and he's going to make it right. Yes. And finally, all your temptations, all your pain, all your yeah. suffering, that will go away. But you have to wait. Yeah. Yes. And you got to get back up. Good. And if you just stay in the ground, then yeah. that's where you're going to stay. You're going to be all muddy and dirty. And then, you know, that's that. Well, if the rapture happens, amen. If we die, then you go to heaven. But that will go away. But look, all the stuff you could have done for the Lord. Instead, wow. you, were, you were sticking into that, clay, and into, that, uh, into that pit. And you stay there. That's, that's kind of pathetic. So bless God, he will provide a way to get you back up. He will provide you a way to get back up. He will lift you up. One day. He will lift you up. And that's my second point. The lift that caused the just to rise. The lift that caused the just to rise. That's my second point. Now, can I just say that no matter what, God can lift you up. He can lift you up. Okay? Go to Psalms 147. Psalms 147. Psalms 147. Psalms 147. Now, you don't need, you know, what's his name? Uh, Robbins? Uh, what's, what's the... Robbins. Tony Robbins. Yeah, you don't, you don't need him. I mean, I don't know that. Yeah. I got you, brother. Yeah. I'm so bad. <laughs> Psalm 147. I'm sorry. Oh. Psalm 147, verse 6, it reads, The Lord lifted up the meek. That's he cast the wicked down to the ground. Yeah. Now... I'm telling you this right now. God can lift you up. God can lift you up. Now, thank God he can use other people to lift you up. But still, he, he is the one that lifts you up. Now, another thing, too, is that if he lifts you up, that means you got to go somewhere, right? You have a path to go. And God gives you a walk. He gives you a way to, to, uh, to follow. And, you know, you can't. There are times where you should, you know, reflect on how you're performing in your walk. You know, okay, well, I'm not doing this right for the Lord, so I get back on, uh, on this path. But don't look at other people's way how they, uh, how they walk, because what you're going to start doing is that you're going to stay still and then just watch them go, and you're staying still when you should be going. Now, if God has given you a path to walk, that means you have to fill those steps. Somebody can't fill those steps for you. 
You're the only person that can take those steps. Now, just imagine that for a second. God individually, for you, individually, he gave you a path to walk. And those steps you have to fill because no one else can fill them. Amen. Only you can. That should be, that's a privilege. God himself gave you something. Don't take advantage of that. Take it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Psalms 40. Go to Psalms 40. Psalms 40. Psalms 40. It can be discouraging, yes, when you fail over and over again, but that's what's going to happen. You're going to fail over and over and over again. What did you do before Christ? You failed over and over and over again. But now in Christ, at least you're able to fail over and over and over again, and you have somebody that says, hey, it's okay. Because before, probably you had people in your life that are like, ha, 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 you failed. But now you have somebody who goes, hey, it's okay. We'll get through this. Amen. Amen. Psalm 40, verse 2. Psalm 40, verse 2, it reads, He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. Now, you were in a horrible pit, right? You were in a horrible pit. You were definitely in a horrible pit before. Out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Now, God has already established your goings. Ain't that a blessing? Ain't that amazing? He already established your goings. Right now, he's already established it. Now, all you got to do is move. You just got to go. That's all you have to do. Don't think. Just, just go. Uh, I'll end it with this. Uh, so I was a, uh, a basketball player uh, before Christ, and I was really horrible when I was young. Like, I was terrible. I was actually that kid that even though I was tall, most of the, well, not most, all the coaches were like, yeah, no, we don't want you. That's, that's how bad I was. <laughs> uh, but it took me a year to where I was able to get good enough to be on a really good team that's in this area was one of the best teams. And I'll never forget this. Um, we were doing this drill, and the best player on the team's name was Junior. Uh, it's based on this uh, drill where you have to get in position, box somebody out, and then uh, the coach uh, throws the basketball on the top of the board, and you got to get a rebound and then score on the guy. So I first went up with him with a bunch of other players, and I beat the best player. So if you know anything about sports, when someone who is labeled the best player on the team and then proceeds to get beaten by the worst player on the team, there is tension. So now Junior, now it was like a movie. Uh, Junior was staring at me the whole time, and I was staring at him the whole time, because I could tell that all these other 13 guys that were before us didn't matter. I was going to beat every single one of them, and then he and I were going to get back at it. So this was, it was crazy. So he's getting in his running stance. I'm in my running stance. My coach, he blows the whistle. We run towards each other. And this is when sports was physical, not now, where it's kind of... <laughs> no, not now, where it's like, like, you touch them, and then they're like, oh, like, <laughs> my spleen! Yeah. We're, we're all, uh, man, we're, we're punching each other, elbowing, uh, he socked me in the face, I hit him in the stomach, all these different things. I got a bloody nose after the thing. Uh, and as the best player, you know, he beat me. He hit me in the stomach, I fell down, grabbed the board, dunked on it, and then yeah. normally, <laughs> uh, now normally someone who's like at that level would be very cocky, would be very full yeah. of themselves. Yeah. I'll never forget this. What he did was, hey, welcome to the team. <laughs> and so took his hand, he pulled me back up, and then everybody else on the team was like, yeah, man, good job. They're really good, man. You beat all of us. You even beat him. Now, you know what God does for you? He says, hey, wow. get back up. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Wow, that's good. Amen. Hey. That's good. Amen. All right. Randall. Amen. Amen. Let's go, Rob. Woo. All right, brother. I, I, I really don't, don't like popcorn preaching. <laughs> and, I, and I'll tell you why. It normally takes like about 15, 20 minutes for the Lord to show up. <laughs> so, so, so you're going to get a carnal message, guys. So, this, is, this is all flesh right here. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, pastor preached a message on uh, flesh being flesh. So I... So, so I, 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 I'm going I'm to be fleshly about it. Okay, then look, 1 first, uh, first Peter 3, verse 18. 1 uh, Peter 3, verse 18. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. I'm going to start right now. 
All right, then, um, 1 Peter 3.18, 3, the, the Bible says, For Christ also had once suffered for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. That's a lot of cool stuff in here, but but what I want what I want to look at right here right now is that um, he says, "For Christ is one suffer for sins, the just." Who's the just? Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Who's the unjust? That's, that's us, right? That he might bring us to God. It took a it took a just person, a holy righteous person. To, to bring us to God. So I want to I want to kind of just talk Amen. about man this what I think this separates uh, um, um, religion from all from all other religion. I think this separates yeah. everybody puts everybody over here and one man standing. That's Jesus Christ. And, and so I want to I want to I want to talk about his sinlessness. His sinlessness because the Bible says that he did not sin. Yes, yes. Not at all. Yes, he yes. walked this earth and did not sin one time. And this is why Jesus Christ is the one that that can save you and and, 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 and take you in. Because, because he, he did what he was supposed to do. He walked this earth and he and he and he was holy and he was righteous, and that's what God required. That's why we make a big deal about Jesus Christ. Um, John 14, 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's a, that's a big statement, but he earned it. He earned that by, by being holy and being righteous. Uh, Acts 4, 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Wow, man. <laughs> Can you say that about anybody else? Can you say that about Buddha, Muhammad, the Pope, your priest? You can't say nothing. You can't say that. Only Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Amen, amen. amen. First, First Peter 2. First Peter 2, uh, 21. First Peter 2, 21. I, I love this. We're just going gonna to read the scriptures and just look at yeah. how holy our Lord is. He said, it says, uh, first, first Peter 2 21, he says, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Look at verse 22, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself unto him that judges righteously, who... His own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live out the righteousness by whom stripes we were healed. Man, Jesus Christ was sinless inside, outside. He was, he was holy all the way through. And he did, and he did that for us. He, he was, he was, he was the, he was the greatest there is, there was, and there ever be. And it's because of his sinlessness. Hebrews, Hebrews, um, Hebrews 7, 26 says, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So he was, he, he, he came, when he came, he came holy, blameless. Boy, I, I would have I hated to be, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't see how he even made it through his brothers. You know what I mean? Because I, if, if I was the Lord's brother, man, I would have been hating. I would have been finding all kinds of ways to make him sin. This boy ain't sinning, man. I, I, I make him sin. I make some of y'all sin. Yeah, y'all, for, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but, but man, he, he made it through 33 and a half years and did not wow. sin wow. once. Um, 1 Peter 1, verse 18. 
First Peter one verse eighteen. I'm just gonna read through these. Uh, if you if you can catch up, catch up. Um, First Peter one verse eighteen. He says, "For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a, of a lamb without blemish Amen. and without spot." Amen. Wow, man! He was he was. He, that's why he's. That's why he's the one. Yeah. He 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 shed his precious blood and he and he paid for our sins. For uh, Hebrews four verse fifteen, Hebrews four verse fifteen, he says, "For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but in all points yes. tempted like as we are." Yet without sin. Wow, man. Can you, can, can you imagine that? Can you, this is what blows me away about this verse. Imagine all the temptations that he went through. Bible says he went through all points like as we are. He probably, he probably had some people giving him a hard time. He probably had some ladies, you know, they probably liked him, tried to get with him and stuff like that. He's like, nah. Uh -uh, I'm serving God, man. <laughs> yes, either you follow, either you follow me right, or don't follow me at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. He probably, but but he went this whole time sinless, man. Did you get that yet without sin? Amen. Wow. First John three five. He said, "And ye know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin." Wow. Hallelujah. Sinless. Wow. This is crazy. Amen. Uh, Tom just did this one. He just he just quoted this one um, um, in his message. He said, "Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear where we shall be, but we know when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath hope in Him purifieth himself, even as He is pure." Wow, man! Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord that he walked this earth because if he didn't do that, we couldn't be You're saved. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, I mean, I understand people resurrect. There's already there's all kinds of different things that probably somebody did in some uh, way or manner, but nobody walked this earth sinless yeah. except yeah. Jesus Christ. Amen. A amen. I mean, he he never he I mean he never even understood what sin was. He was never acquainted with it. He, I mean, it was total strangers to him. The first experience that he had with sin is when he took ours. Yeah. Wow. When he took ours. And the best part about it is when he took ours, he gave, he, he gave us his righteousness. Amen. Look at this, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. The Bible says, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, for he had made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him? Wow, isn't that great? Isn't that great? Now, now that he did the job, he made it to where we're, we're going to stand before God holy. Man, I mean, imagine the things that go through our minds and all that stuff. When we stand before God, we're going to be righteous. We're going to stand before him. And we're not even going to have a sinful thought. I can't, I can't imagine that. Man, walking this earth, man, especially in Silicon Valley over here, man. It, man, man, they pick, they, I know they, they wicked over here. And, and you know what? It easily rubs off on us too. But when we stand before God in heaven, no sin. We, we're not going to even worry about it. He was talking about that new body. We're, we're going to be sinless. We're going to have a new attitude. We're going to be sinless. And it's because of what Christ did for us. He, he sacrificed himself for us. For he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Praise the Lord. So, so hearing all that, what are we going to do with this? Especially for the new year. You know what? We need to, we need to really see what Christ did for us and, 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 and get rid of some of the sin in our life. Y'all know y'all list. He was talking about that phone. You, you, sometimes we get on this phone too much. You know how much you're looking at? I, I think I, uh, my phone, at the, at the end of the week, it gives you your screen time. 
Yeah. You want you want you want to get right with God? Look at that screen time and say, I need to stop doing that. I need to stop doing that. Cause all the time that you're on there, you're not doing so with God. And don't give me that. Oh, I'm listening to YouTube preacher. Come on, man. A yeah, YouTube preacher? No way. I'm serious. I'm serious. I I I, I, I watch a message and the minute that message hit, everything else is coming in, man. Man, turn that thing off and just. Listen to an audio. There's no commercials on audio. There's no temptations, you know what I mean? Just get you a, well, they ain't got tapes no more, but you, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and then, uh, my phone, all right, there, I, got, I, got, I got one more minute. Hebrews 12, 1. Hebrews 12, 1. Okay, Hebrews 12, 1. Maybe this will uh, just give us a thought for the new year. Okay, it says Hebrews twelve one. Wherefore, seeing we're all we, we also are accomplished about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight like Christ did, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and run with patience the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's my. Favorite name for Jesus Christ right there. The author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him which in, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. You, we, need, we need to just fight this race, go all the way through, and, and let's, try to, let's try to be like Christ would have us to be. Yeah. If, if, we don't, if we don't consider what he did as a sinless sacrifice, it, we can, it, it, it'll lead us to backslide. That's what it says at the end, lest you be weary and fade in your minds. So Lord willing, the Lord will help us. To try to be better Christians for the next year, but but just thank God when we're done and we're and we're out of here, we won't have to worry about it no more. We'll be we'll be sinless. Amen. So, before I got saved, this isn't going to be the most spiritual thing in the world, but there was a movie series that I like to watch. It was called Band of Brothers, and it was uh, based off of World War II. It was the 101st Airborne. There was a company within that called the Easy Company, and uh, the, the show was really following their deployment throughout uh, World War II. And uh, there's two soldiers within Easy Company. One was Blythe, and another one was Lieutenant Spears. And Blythe was kind of uh, portrayed as a coward, and Lieutenant Spears was portrayed as a heartless, cold-blooded killer, and uh, he was kind of a mysterious character that everybody was afraid of. And uh, basically within the show, uh, which I believe is based on a true story, interviews with the actual uh, soldiers who were part of Easy Company, uh, Blythe, during D-Day, they gave him some uh, medication to help with the turbulence of the airplane and whatnot. So when he had landed, he landed in a ditch. And instead of grabbing his weapon, uh, finding his company, finding where he was, where he needed to go, he fell asleep. And when he woke up, he didn't bother fighting. He didn't bother looking. He just stayed put and uh, wow. really just waited until he figured it was time to go. And uh, as time went on, Blythe felt really bad about this. He became guilty of what he had done. And he confessed to Lieutenant Spears about falling asleep in the ditch instead of fighting. The Lieutenant Spears responded to Blythe saying, uh, you hid in that ditch because you think there's still hope. But Blythe, the only hope you have is accept the fact that you're already dead. And the sooner you accept that, the sooner you'll be able to function as a soldier is supposed to function. Wow. Wow. So uh, my scripture today is 2 Timothy 2, chapter, uh, verses 3 and 4. 2 Timothy 2, verses Amen. 3 and 4. Yeah. Uh, it says, uh, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Yeah. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, 
that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you please get me out of the way and put my flesh to the side and allow me to preach a message according to your will, Lord, and allow us to gain a blessing from this. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Blythe, when he landed in that ditch, found himself holding on to how life used to be before war, before he became a soldier. And oftentimes, us Christians do that with our salvation. We wow. hold on to how we used to be right. before we got saved. That's good preaching. Now, for a soldier, war changes them. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it be PTSD or injury or whatever it may be. I know back in the day, they used to suffer from shell shock. I don't know if that's really a thing much anymore, but... It, war completely changes you, and to go back to how you used to be before mm -hmm. war, it's almost impossible, wow. if not impossible. Yeah. War completely changes you, right. and uh, as Christians, salvation completely changes us, yes. Yes. and no yeah. matter how yeah. hard we try to hold on to how we used to be right. before we reason. got saved... We will never be who we were before we got saved. Yeah, that's good. Whether it be uh, th just the knowledge of sin and knowing what you're doing is wrong, that's right. you cannot go back to being blind. Yeah. You, you have a new body, a new name. We've already heard that preaching tonight. Yeah. There, there's, there's plenty of new things you gain when you get saved, and you cannot go back to how things used that's to be. Good. That's good, now, most times, I mean, you can backslide. Obviously, you guys know my testimony. I've been backsliding for half my salvation already. So, uh, you know, you find yourself in that ditch. But you, you, whether you trip and you fall into the ditch or you willingly crawl back into it, just saying sorry to the Lord sometimes isn't enough. Yeah. Just praying for forgiveness while you're laying in that ditch, it's, it's not enough. You just, you keep committing the same sins over and over. Right. You keep praying for forgiveness, but you're not doing anything about it. The Lord is waiting for you to not just pray for forgiveness, yeah. but to grab his hand and yeah. stand yes. up. Amen. Yeah. You need to not only pray for Amen. forgiveness, but yeah. to actually fight yes. and fight. to fight your fight. flesh. Yeah. That's what the entire Christian faith is about. It's what our life is. It's war, it's war between yeah. us and the flesh between the Holy Spirit inside of us and our flesh. And unless you grab your weapon, unless you grab your Bible, and you fight, you're just going to be laying in that ditch, Come on, cold, whatever it may be, falling asleep, not serving the Lord, and what the Lord really wants is for you to serve Him. Right, good. So, uh, that's about it. That's, that's all I got. Yeah, that was I forgot my notebook at home, okay? Alright, 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Which message are you looking for? I don't know. I got a text from my wife just two seconds ago. Alright, let me just go ahead and pray. Uh, God, my Father, I just thank you so much, Father, for, like Brother Jonathan prayed, Lord, another new year, Father, to look yes. forward to, Lord. And uh, thank you so much, Father, for your mercy, for getting us all here safely, for grace, Father. I pray and ask God, if there's anyone here that is lost, I pray that they, today would be the day of salvation, Father. Yes. I pray you'd put me behind you, Father, and uh, I pray that you'd speak to us personally, Lord God. I don't know how to preach. I don't deserve to even be up here. So I just pray you get all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Second Kings chapter 6. Three. Second Kings chapter 6. So basically what I'm going to say is that Max preached my message already. Oh. So <laughs> it'll cost you, brother. It'll cost you. Alright. Basically, okay, so I'm just going to say Max's point. Oftentimes we fall in our Christian walk. And oftentimes we lose fellowship in our Christian walk. Yeah. Sometimes when we backslide and fall and get back up, yeah. we're not as committed as we used to be. Mm -hmm. Right? You're not as faithful. 
you're not as willing to grow, your heart uh, isn't as much in the fight, and it gets easier to sin, it gets easier to give up. It doesn't take much temptation for you to sin anymore. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of going to talk about falling, you know, but it's not going to be like Max's. It's more along the lines of, you know, maybe the problem is, isn't, isn't about how often you fall. Like the Bible says, a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. We understand that. But maybe that's not the problem. Maybe. Maybe your problem is, is that when you do fall and you get back up, you get back up on the wrong foot. What am I saying? Maybe you do this so often that when you get up on the, uh, on the wrong foot, you have so many different times or you still have so many different locations where you restart off the wrong track and now and you're at a point where you have too many tracks that you don't even know where, whether you're in the, the Lord's will anymore. Okay, so 2 Kings chapter 6. And we'll just go ahead and read. Look at verse 1. I just got three points for you. I pray that it'd be a message or a help as well. Verse 1, it says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with uh, thee is too straight for us. In other words, it's too narrow, it's too small, right? Verse 2, Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content. I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. Verse 4, And he, so he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe had fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. Okay, so the first thing I kind of want to talk about, what you'll find here is that the sons of the prophets, what they're doing is, right, it says here that they're in a place that's too small for them, so they decide to go unto Jordan, and so they could find a new dwelling place, right, in verse 2. And in verse 3, what happens is that one of the, uh, the servants go, and one of the sons of the prophets, he decides to go, and Elisha says, sure, yeah, go ahead. And as that one, of, that one son of the prophet is cutting down or felling the beam, he's cutting that wood down, his axe head falls off. So the first thing I want to talk about is that axe head itself, right? What is the purpose of that axe head? It, it was to cut down some wood. The axe is also used to cut down some unfruitful trees. Matthew 3.10, it says, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. Another thing you'll find in verse 5 is that that axe head itself, it had some value because it was borrowed. In other words, it was something that was given to him that he didn't have before. So the question here for you is, what is your axe head? Oh, wow. Right. Maybe it's faith. You didn't have faith before. Maybe it's your blessed assurance. It's prayer, right? I mean, I was raised a Catholic. I didn't have prayer life. I didn't have a real prayer life. I had vain repetition, all, whatever. We'll sing about that song later. Um, <laughs> maybe your axe head is a peace that nothing in this world can give you. Maybe it's a comfort. Matthew 7.11 says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? 2 Peter 1, uh, verses 3 to 4 says, According as his um, divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us, just like that accent that was borrowed, exceeding great and precious promises that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we found out what that axe head could be for you, but now we're going to find out about how the axe head falls. Now, you'll notice, if you guys have ever seen an axe, especially if the old-fashioned axe, 
Um, there's three things that keep that axe together. You have a handle and you have the axe head, right? Yeah. What keeps the axe together is that there's three components. There's, there's the eye of the axe head, right, the hole. Uh -huh. There's the handle, it's called the kerf. I'll explain what that is in a second. And basically what it is, it's like, it, it goes into the eye of the needle and there's a little space for a wedge. And that's the third part, it's a wedge. So let's look at these three things. Now what they say that keeps the axe together itself is friction. So the first part of the axe head, or yeah, the first part that keeps the axe head together is the eye, is the eye, right? So the eye is the piece of wood securing the handle to the head. Matthew 6 verses uh, 22 and 23, it says, "The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, um, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Wow. Yeah, if therefore they, uh, if therefore uh, the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Right. So maybe the first component of that accent being true. kept together, maybe your eye, yeah. your eyes are looking at the wrong things. Yeah. That's real good. Is that why your accent is falling apart? That's real good for each. The second part of that axe head being kept together is the kerf, right? Remember I told you, it says here most commonly a handle uh, with a slotted end, right? It's called a kerf, is shaped and fitted snugly to the eye of the axe. The Bible says in Proverbs 25 verse 11, a, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Maybe you're listening to the wrong things. Yeah. And that kerf, that little swatted edge, it's, it's not as fit as it should be. Come on. Now the third thing is, uh, this is the most important part of the axe head being fit together, is the wedge itself. It's the thing that gets put in there, right? Because what happens is that with, that with that space, that wedge comes in, and it creates that friction that keeps it together, right? It says here, an axe wedge is a small, thin piece of wood or metal that is driven into the kerf, of the handle. Its purpose is to stop the axe head from coming off. Yeah. It's the thing that's holding the axe head together. It's holding it in place. Go to Hebrews chapter 1 really quick. Hebrews chapter 1. What is that wedge? That is keeping your faith and your prayer life and your relationship and that peace inside of you. Hebrews chapter 1. What is the wedge? And look at verse 1, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, 1 to 3. The Bible says, God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heirs of all things, by whom also he made the world who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. What is that? Jesus Christ is that wedge in your life. Jesus Christ is that wedge. Maybe the most important thing that is holding the axe head, maybe your relationship with Jesus who is your wedge, wow, is not where it should be. Wow. Wow. You know, your axe head is it's your faith, it's your prayers, it's, it's your spiritual walk yeah, yeah. that God allows you to have. You didn't have it before, and it was, now it's borrowed, and it has value now. But oftentimes when these things are, when these three things are, are out of order, that axe head of yours, it just falls right off. Wow. Go back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. So we looked at the axe head. We looked at the axe head falling off. Now we're going to look at the axe head found. Come on, tell us. 2 Kings chapter 6. And look at verse uh, 6. 2 Kings 6, 6. The Bible says, And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. I mean, you think about iron. Does it float or it sinks? It sinks. Oh, what a miracle. Sure. 
Now what happens here is that Elisha asks the son of the prophet where the location of where it fell off. So he takes Elisha there, and he goes there. And he goes to the place where he lost it, and the iron swims back to him. Now, I was listening to Dr. Ruckman's Colossians commentary, and man, there is just so much gold in there. But this is where I got this from, this whole message. Dr. Ruckman says in his Colossians commentary, sometimes the best place to find a thing is where you lost it. Wow. So I want to close with this. Where you lost your conviction at one point or another, where your relationship with God, your desire to grow was dropped off. I mean, you got saved first, and then you're full of zeal. Maybe you didn't have the most wisdom. Sure. You went out there, and you're, you're giving the gospel to your family members, and they hated you for it. Okay. But now you're not willing anymore. You lost it. Wow. And maybe... You have to go to the very place where you lost it so that you can get back up, Amen. right? Amen. Maybe you need to come to the God-man, Jesus Christ, and tell him exactly where you lost your axe head so that he can bring it back up. The iron was impossible to bring up. It sinks, and yet it came up because God is the one that brought it up. So stop repenting around the issue and That's repent good. right directly at it. The That's Bible good. says, Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Amen. 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 Proverbs uh, 24, 16, I guess. All right, then. Proverbs 24, 16. Yeah, Lord. Yeah. Um, let's see. Proverbs 24, 16. I didn't prepare a message at all, so <laughs> this is uh, interesting. Uh, it says in Proverbs 24, 16, it says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. And uh, my wife and I went to uh, Tahoe recently, and we were skiing, and she told me, hey, this is something you could uh, preach one day, uh, where she was skiing, and she kept falling down a bunch of times. And uh, basically, we learned a lot as well. And uh, I, I, uh, we had someone as well, and uh, we were taking a first-time cl uh, class in uh, skiing together, and there was another lady named Ruth. And uh, she kept falling and things like that. And uh, I guess in life, there's many times where we fall in life. And maybe in our previous years, 2022, 2021, 2020, whatever those years are, we messed up probably in certain things in our lives. And I'm not sure what you messed up in in 2022. Maybe it was some sinful things that you kept, some things of the world that you kept. Some things, maybe you were slothful or things like that. I don't know what it is that you, uh, I guess, had uh, holding on to that you weren't willing to give up in 2022. But in 2023, can you get back up and uh, do more for the Lord? Amen. And uh, maybe there's some things I know. Uh, let's, let's see. Philippians chapter 3. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3. And uh, I know Paul. Paul had a a lot of problems in his life, right? He used to be a Pharisee and he persecuted many Christians and he killed uh, many Christians in uh, uh, the past and uh, he persecuted them. But, you know, uh, he moved on and the Lord did something with his life. And uh, Philippians chapter 3 and uh, verses 13, it says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And in 2023, can we forget the things of the past of 2022 and press for the mark of 2023? 
And uh, there's some things that we need to do, Christian, and God commands us to do things, just like Brother Mark said, to be a good soldier yes. of Jesus Christ. Yes. And God wants us to be faithful, brethren. And uh, let's go to, let's see, I was reading Genesis uh, this morning, or earlier today, and uh, Genesis 3, and it talks about uh, the serpent, right? And he'll subtle uh, more than any beast of the field which the Lord uh, had made. And uh, the, uh, the devil questions uh, what God said, right? In uh, Genesis 2, verses 16 to 17, uh, he doesn't uh, quote, let's actually go there. Verses uh, 16 to 17, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. And verses 17, the devil doesn't give this verse. He doesn't quote, uh, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it for in the day. So he gave a partial truth, and oftentimes the devil will give a partial truth. Like, just like in uh, Matthew chapter 4, he gives a partial truth and things like that, and he tried to tempt uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, what we need to do is use scripture. And uh, we see here, and go back to Genesis chapter 3, and uh, verses 2, in the middle of verses 2, it says, Yea. The devil says, yea, hath God said. And uh, there's a lot of things that the devil does in our lives that he tries to give something positive in our life to get us back into the world. He gives something positive, something enticing that tries to mess with us. And we get us to question. We get, he tries to get us to doubt. So there may be some things like, hey, you know, something in the word of God, you know, uh, says that choose whom you this serve, uh, choose you who this day you serve. But the devil's going to, hey, no, you Maybe you want to do this in your life. Maybe there's some career that you want to do in your life. Uh, but God's wanting you to do something else. And the devil's trying to get you to fall away from the Lord and get you to walk away from him. But can we do something and say no to the devil? There's something that we need to do is we need to tell the devil that, hey, it is written. That's why it's important for us to get the word of God in our heart. The Bible says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even the dividing sunder of soul and spirit. So we need to get acquainted with the word of God so we can combat this. When, when the devil tries to tempt us, it tries to give us something positive that is uh, half true, then we can simply combat him with the Bible. And uh, hopefully in 2023, we can get more acquainted with the word of God. And there's some things that God wants us to do in our lives. And uh, uh, this message wasn't planned. I don't really know what else to say. Um, yeah, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> very impressed I was very impressed Wow praise the Lord uh, uh, every revival meeting uh, I can see your growth thank you Wow it's a blessing it gives hope for us pastors it gives us hope for us pastors amen all right I will give you about about eight minutes okay eight minutes at 9 p.m. when that uh, clock goes 9 p.m. We will start with Pastor Smith preaching, all right? Good job. Amen. That was so good, guys. Amen. What a great way to uh, start the new year with the soul saved in a watch night service. Welcome, Christian. Welcome to the family. Yeah, run the bass, brother. Yeah, run the bass. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Join him, right? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, uh, brethren, this is an uh, invitation. Uh, Jacob was a, a one that invited him over. And Jacob, he just simply said that, hey, pastor, can you show him how to get saved? And no opposition, no nothing. Usually when you start out witnessing, the starting point is the hardest. Yeah. Look how God used our new brother, Jacob. Thank See, you don't, have to, yeah, you don't have to be an expert soul winner. We're all in this together. Okay? So praise the Lord. God bless you, brother. Amen. You did that. You know, the Lord used you for that. That's a big thing. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so, all right, the message we all want to hear, all right? All right. All right, come on, Pastor Smith. Close off the year for us. Amen. <laughs> Here you go, sir. Okay. Amen. Preach all right. God laid on your heart. All right. Proverbs chapter 3. <laughs> Proverbs. It's Oh, just the knowledge, yeah. All right. Okay, now. 
Uh, if y'all looking for something sophisticated or real educated, Woo! you're in the wrong place. <laughs> well, we'll get this on in a minute. All right. Uh, who is Jacob? Which one is Jacob? Are you the one that called me? Yes, sir. That's him. Is that right? All right. Well, glory to God. That's good. Okay. All right. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3. Okay, we're going to change speeds a little bit here. Going to be a little bit different. Now, uh, every one of those uh, popcorn preachers, I, I wanted to say something about every one of them and the messages, but I forgot them already. So <laughs> We're over that. <laughs> ah, well, the psalmist said that the Lord crowned us the year with His goodness. I just want to thank God for being so good to me. And He has really crowned my year and been so good. I thank God for Him. All right, Proverbs chapter 3 going to help you tonight, I hope. I want to be a blessing and a help. And uh, this is uh, going to be uh, something about the new year. You haven't made it yet. Middle 1201. You may be in glory before 1201. Then you can just have a, a fit. Amen. A fit. That'll be a good one. Okay. Proverbs chapter number three and verse number one. Uh, this message is uh, uh, called the Hard Times versus God's Economy. And uh, you don't know uh, exactly what's going to happen to the economy this next year. So I thought I'd give you something from the Bible to help you. And I'll give you some uh, uh, secular things to go along with this, and uh, especially from uh, some of your friends up in the government. <laughs> the one man said this, the government that can uh, take responsibility for all the people, the people will have no responsibility. That's, good. that's, good. Uh, that's exactly Right, and we're working that way now. So, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 1, my son. But doesn't that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. My son. Yeah. He's talking to me. Yeah. He's talking to me, my son. He said. Someplace he calls me a little children. That's, that's me. All right. Well, sometimes, man, you need to read those little bitty things and they just tear me up, man. I mean, man. Sometimes I, I just rub this book and cry over that thing, and the Lord calls me the, His favorite son. Wow. He calls you His favorite yeah. son. Yeah. Where can you find a God like that? Wow. Man, is He good. good. My son, forget not my law. Let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Yeah. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and in all thy ways. Well, let me back up here. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding and in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Now, understanding the economy... In this country, with all of its deficits, unemployment, yeah. borrowing, the feds, yeah. print with nothing to back it up, and many other things, it's quite a task to keep up with it. And the government of the Americans uh, has expanded their duties way beyond what their duties are. Really and truly, the government is set up to protect us from foreign invasion, number one. Number two is to keep the citizens from each other's throat and property. <laughs> and number three, developing foreign trade to get those things that we don't have here that we need. Boy, have they surpassed that many years ago. President Hoover, when he served, uh, which reminds me of a, a story I read the other day, which got nothing to do with the message, but I thought this would be good for you. <laughs> There's a governor that used to be in Louisiana between 1921 and 1925, Governor Neff. And it was coming to the end of his uh, term, and he does uh, like many presidents and governors do. He went to the prison to see 
if there was anybody there he would like to pardon. And so quite a few of them lined up and they would come and say, well, I'm innocent and I got framed or I just happened to be hanging around in the wrong place. All kinds of excuses. And finally one man come along and says, Governor, he said, I'm as guilty as sin. I did what they put me in here for, but I believe I've served my time. And the governor pardoned him. Pardoned him. Bible says in uh, uh, Proverbs 28, 13, is it Proverbs 28, 13, did we confess our sins, his faithful and just to forgive us our sins? You've got to confess your sins, and that's what he did. I just thought I'd throw that in there, but I'm talking about the government. The President Hoover served our country during the Great Depression. And uh, he believed in individuals helping themselves and helping others using charities that were headed by regular people. Okay, not the government. Private charities, that's what he believed in. Kind of a hands-off approach. Wouldn't that be great today if we had that a hands-off approach? They're always trying to take care of me. <laughs> but then we had FDR. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Yep, and then we had FDR. And FDR in 1932 took a campaign swing through the South. Now there's a reason for that, and you'll find that out in just a moment why he went to the south instead of the north or the west or wherever, or the east. And in that campaign, he convinced the American people that there was great poverty and sanitation problems in the south. And these people were in bad need of help. That's me he was talking about. All right, I just thought I'd let you know. He said, I want to make a good life for Americans. And so, America needed a Savior, and it was FDR. And that Savior was the FDR and the government. And uh, if you were to read about the Great Depression, most people, they, now, now somebody was talking about the city, city life and one of the popcorn preaching, but you know that 66% of all Americans now live in the city limits are the suburbs of the city. Not in the country anymore. All right? So, uh, in the Depression, most owned their own land. They just didn't have any money. And uh, so, FDR says, what we need is a new deal. Somebody talked about new things. Well, this isn't in the Bible. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> FDR came up with it. It's called New Deal. And from the New Deal, he got the AAA, and that's the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. In other words, price control. That's been our problem for a long time, price control. And then he started the TVA. And the TVA was to develop power projects, and he called it the Tennessee Valley Association, power control. We've got price control, now he worked on power control. And then the REA, the REA is Rural, Rural Electrification Administration, in other words, pleasant life control. I don't know if you guys, anybody here has ever read Henry and the Great Society? You haven't read that, you ought to read it. It's just a small book, Henry and the Great Society. You need to read that thing. It came from this era. All right? Uh, most of the New Deal success, success, though, was after FDR died, after World War II, actually. But as we look at the government beginning to control the economy, now we have the taker controlling the maker. It's all turned upside down. Just a few months ago, the CEO of Amazon said this, don't go in debt, there's going to be a big market crash. And pretty, they pretty well own a big share of the market, I suspect. But see, we've got a God with his own economy. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, he's got his own economy. Now, you're probably not going to run the bases on this. 
but I believe you can get some help because I don't know what's going to happen down the line. And uh, there's nothing that says that God's going to deliver us if there is a great depression again, okay? So you may just have to live in this thing. So we're going to help you from the Bible understand God's economy and uh, complete with how to lay up in store uh, what the interest rates you can get from this economy, what the investments will be paid off. I've, I've put my money in, in, in uh, IRAs a couple of times over the last 20, 30 years. I've lost in all of them. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, I'm still trying. I may be a winner before the Lord takes me home, but I doubt it anyway. But pay off in charities. You know, there's all kinds of things out there. But first, uh, I want you to know that God's economy is not forced on anyone. He's not going to make you follow His economy, even though it's laid out clearly in this Bible. Second, if you will enter into His economy... uh, and exchange the world's economy, the government's economy, for his economy, you will only gain. You will never lose. You won't have to check the stocks every day and the buy shares and, and, and do all that other stuff. Uh, the third is, there's a cross with it. You can't serve God without a cross. There's always going to be a cross somewhere. Uh, But in this cross that there is in God's economy is a life lived as He would have it lived. It's a life you can lay your head down on your pillow at night and, man, just sleep like a baby. It's okay. It's okay, all right? Uh, So many Christians that I've seen and and just about all the lost people are wrapped up on 70 years of this life. That's all they think about this 70 years. That's it. That's right. Listen, if you make 80, uh, then you can't party with the money you got. The people who fund research for a long life, you know who they are? It's guys, it's women, it's people that have made their fortune after 50 years old. And they've got the fortune and ain't got much time to do anything. So they fund the research on long life. Now, you can read that and find that out for yourself. But... I want to warn you about something. If you go out and try to tell the lost people in the world, and our government especially, about this economy, (laughs) uh, it would make no sense to the worldly. It will not. Uh, I have an article. Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit of it. And this is first about Fauci. And when he had a meeting with... uh, uh, President Trump right after this started in 2020. And she said, I'm not going to preside. Well, Trump said this after he was lied to by Fauci and the others uh, that were dealing with the, the vaccines and money from all that. He says, President Trump said, I'm not going to preside over the funeral of the greatest country in the world. And Fauci answered with this. He said, I just do medical advice. I don't think about things like the economy and the secondary impacts. I'm just an infectious doctor. (laughs) Good old Dr. Fauci, he doesn't worry about all that. Now, uh, the pandemic planners created paper prosperity to cover up the grim reality that they had brought about. They started just printing money. And they're talking about that. They're talking about a 1.7 trillion. (laughs) Where does this kind of money come from? Can you think in that? Uh, But it, it could not and did not last. Between January 2021 and September 2022, Prices increased 13.5% across the board, costing the average American family September alone off of your income. Even if inflation were to stop today, the inflation already in the bag will cost the average American family $8,739 over the next 12 months, and that's from uh, November. 
That's what he said. Now, uh, what our government has done is acted like they cared for us and printed us money. Uh, in the Civil War, uh, the English printed Confederate money to buy money from the Confederates. And that ruined the Confederates. They had no money. Now what your government is doing today is what I call the Hezekiah plan. As long as it's not in my term. As long as it's not in my life. It's going to be you young people. That's where it's going to. So that's just a little introduction of what I'm going to give you out of the Bible. And uh, 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 I'm going to give you some essentials for operating in God's economy in case our economy of this uh, country goes to pot. And uh, we're already suffering from it. So listen to this. Turn with me in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Uh, all these things are not going to be new. I don't think any of them will be new. But uh, we've got to go over this because if you have to live in it, you have to live in it. All right, God wants you to live till He takes you out of here. And so you need to know how to live. Bob Jones Sr. said when he was just a young boy, he said, if I'm going to live somewhere forever, I need to learn how to live. Okay, you need to learn how to live. So 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. This is a simple plan. God's economy is not hard to understand. Okay, His taxes aren't hard to understand. 1 Timothy 6, look in verse number 12. In 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Look in verse 19. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Whatever happens with the economy, you lay hold on it. Yeah. So what, you're, what are you going to have to do? What does this mean? It means you're going to have to do one of those. Let me count the letters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's a bad ten-letter word. Discipline. <laughs> discipline. You're going to have to discipline yeah. yourself. Yeah. Folks, your Bible gives you the starting line on discipline with money. Can I give it to you? Because God gave it to me and He gave it to you. It's over in Genesis chapter 21. You say, I didn't know there was anything about money over in Genesis. Um, did I say 21? 41. Sorry. <laughs> 41. Well, that probably gives you a little hint as to uh, what is going to fo follow here. But here we have in Genesis chapter number 41. Look in verse number 37. In Genesis 41, 37. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall... Now remember, Joseph is type of Christ in 152 particulars. All right? And uh, 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 he says, And thou shalt be over my house, and according to, unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck and he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had and they cried before him bow the knee and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt and Pharaoh said unto Joseph I am Pharaoh and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or his foot in the land of Egypt and Pharaoh called Joseph's name I can't say that but and he gave him the wife I can say this Asenath I believe, and the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, and Joseph went over, out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, 
the earth brought forth by handfuls. Now, if you will help me, I didn't mark this part, but I should have. But I'm looking for, it's in one of those chapters, and I didn't write the verse down. I'm looking for uh, the part that says uh, he'll take one-fifth of their income. That's probably not in here. Okay, well, let's just forget. Okay, Joseph, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, the starting, if, if, if the, I've got to have this in somewhere. I know I put it in here. I've got nobody else to blame now. Uh, in here, he takes the money from the people. It's in another chapter. That's why I don't have it. And basically, he takes one fifth. All right, so one fifth is a little bit more than one tenth, isn't it? Yep. Okay, so in the Bible, God's economy is set up on you can live off eighty percent of what they pay you. You say, well, how do you figure that? Well, God gets ten percent. It's a starting line. This is a starting place, and the government gets ten percent, which they don't. They get more than that. You can live off 80% according to God. You can do that. I don't have the, the, the scripture here, but it's in there. Uh, in Acts chapter number 20 and verse number 20, that's Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. A little hiccup there, but I think we'll get over it. Acts 20 and verse 35. The starting point of every Christian is you live off 80% of your income. I haven't told you where to spend the other 20% or who's going to get it, but I'll, I'll get around to that. Look here in chapter 20 of Acts and look in verse 35. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support, support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than receive. Now, that is opposite of today's thinking. The government is a taker and is no end sample for you and I on giving. An end sample is something that you can pattern yourself after. Yeah. An example may be a bad example, but an end sample is something you can pattern yourself after you and uh, after uh, whoever, whoever or whatever it is. The government is not earning what they give you. Yeah. They're not earning what they give you. So you need to discipline yourself to be able to live off 80% and maybe tighter than that if the economy yeah. does crash. Yeah, that's good. Okay? Yeah. And then you need to condition yourself to support missions. Now I have my own opinions as to why as God has let us be the greatest country on earth as long as it has because we, we put out more porn than any other country in the world. Southern California puts about all the porn in the world out down there in Southern California. Right. And uh, we're, we're making laws now. Pretty soon they're going to pressure churches for start letting the, uh, you know, the perverts in. They, yeah. they, they will do it yeah. if, if yeah. the Lord tarries. But supporting missions, even in hard times, keeps God's favor on this country. Amen. And now, folks, if you if you ever read the uh, if you ever read uh, the, the the Southern Baptists have a Lottie Moon offering at Christmas time. Any of you? I'm a licensed Southern Baptist preacher, and I, I'm where. I, have you ever read the story? Anybody here ever read Lottie Moon's story? Yeah. I'll tell you what. That was some woman. She sure was. She was. I mean, she served for several years over there in China all by herself yep, they and won people to the Lord wow. and lived off hardly nothing. Yep. Wow. Uh, a missionary story will, will tear your heart out or yes, you'll pull it down and quit. Amen. That's what they'll do. Wow. But you need to condition yourself to support missions because I believe that's why we're able to, able to do what we're doing here tonight. We preach the word on the street. Amen. We send it across the country. Amen. We support these people. Amen. They're getting in countries that are where Christians are banned and the gospel is not to be preached. Yep. But somebody's going over there and doing that. And they're getting away with it. And if your money's going to that, man, that goes to your account. 
the uh, the judgment seat of Christ isn't going to be all that. Wow. It's going to be pretty good if you support missionaries. That's right. Good. You yeah. need to condition yourself to support missionaries. Yeah. Uh, uh, that may be that the USA has fallen, uh, but I believe the minority is keeping it from falling and not getting back up. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what I believe. I need a world vision for souls. You need a world vision. Amen. We Amen. have men and women who give themselves to that world vision to go out there and win souls. Amen. Sometimes in some of the listen, we we uh, we 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 supported Brother Old. He went to New Guinea and helped Brother Mullins build a, a church buildings and stuff like that. He lived off spam for a year. When his wife got back from to America, she said, "I'll never look at another can of spam in my life." That's all they had to eat as far as meat was concerned. Do you ever have a, 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 a anyway, I like spam. <laughs> <laughs> see, I'm going to tell you something. If this economy tanks, I could probably outlive the rest of you. I can eat cat, white meat. <laughs> I can eat squirrel, I can eat possum, I can eat black snake, I can eat coon, I can eat everything there is.
Brother Wheat, John Whitty, Wheat, he was a missionary many years in, in Australia. He was one of the greatest soul winners I ever met. That was his favorite verse. Amen. Stick by the stuff. He said, I appreciate them. They keep me where the stuff is. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an uh, ordinance for Israel unto this day. And when David came to Ziklag, he sent him the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends saying, Behold a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. To them which were in Bethel, and to them which were in South Ramoth, and to them which were in Jatir, and to them which were in Aurora, and to them which were in Ziphmoth, and to them which were in Estamoa, and to them which were in Rachel, and to them which were in the cities of Jeremiah's, and to them which were in the cities of the Kenites, and to them which were in Hormah, and to them which were in Korshan, and to them which were in Aphak, and to them which were in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were wont to haunt. Mm. Have you ever read the story of David coming back from the battle of Absalom? Mm -hmm. And he's coming over the brook Kidron, and all those people met him? Yep. Even when he went to the battle, People surrounding him said, we're going with you to the battle. Right. Yeah. When you're reading what happened, he made friends of mammon. Mm. Wow. He helped everybody with his money okay. and gave it to them. When it took time to go into the battle, mm. David had friends that showed up. That's how you make friends of mammon. Good, Sam Gipp said this, to a young man that came to him and he was in financial trouble and it was what I think he was with a youth pastor up in Ohio when he did this. And this young man and his wife were in financial problem and uh, he got one of the uh, fellows in the church that's well to do to help him out and to give him money, not loan him money. It's not a good idea to loan money in your church. Right. If you want to give money, okay, but don't loan it. And he gave this boy money, and the boy got back on his feet, and uh, Brother Gilbert went up to him and said, uh, now that you're back on your feet, why don't you go take Brother so-and-so and his wife out there? He said, well, man, they got plenty of money. They, they don't need me to take them out there. He said, yes, they do. They helped you. You go show them how much you appreciate yeah. them taking care of you. Yeah. Oh, Amen. Make friends Amen. of man. Now what I like to do, Amen. every once in a while I have one right now that's, uh, that he's dying of cancer. Uh, anytime he's going to die, but uh, he, he, he's got no money. He, 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 you know, he's, he, uh, he pastored for years and he shut his uh, church down. And the only insurance he has, he was a veteran from the Navy and, and they've been treating for the cancer that he has. I won't tell you who he is, but every once in a while our church gives him a bundle of money and I go by and give him money myself. He'll never be able to repay me. You know, there is nothing wrong with you going and finding a brother or a sister that's in trouble that you know that they can't repay you amen. and don't yeah. expect them to repay you yeah. and you help them out. Yeah, amen. Don't look for anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Make friends of mammon. You don't know what next year is going to hold. Right. He may not crown next year with his good wow. He may not. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Amen. Amen. That's good. <clears throat> Thank you. The second thing to do if the economy crashes is black ink. You know what black ink is? It ain't red, honey. Yep. You won't be living in the red like our government. $1.7 million dollar a trillion dollar economy, they, they, their, their budget. I, that's living in the red, folks. Yeah. Yeah. That's living in the red. <clears throat> Biblically interpreted, I'm talking about black ink. Biblically interpreted, black is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, that's what God wants you to do, live in the black. That's right. Amen. The world's economy and the Lord's economy are, are so different. The Lord's economy is a beautiful economy. It will cause yeah, you to have peace, more peace than you had by trusting Jesus Christ as your personal.
miserable Savior, folks. Yes. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes. The world, the world's economy, and the Lord's economy, they're hard to mix. They mm -hmm. just don't mix. You ever, you ever work in a lab and 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 have a water and 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 acid? Does anybody here know how to mix water and acid? The proper way to mix water and acid, brother Tom, how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta pour the acid in the water little by little. Uh huh. The acid in the water. Why is that? Uh, otherwise, you can make it boil over. And yeah. Splatter all over. It wouldn't be too much fun. See, the world's economy and God's economy—they don't mix. If you put the world's economy and God's economy, it's going to start boiling over. It could blow up on you and wow. get some acid on you. Like That's you good. Burn. Amen. Yeah. You see, you got to choose one or the other. The world's economy is take her. Yeah. Take her. And God's economy, he says, you need to be a maker. Yeah. And you need to make friends of man. Yeah. The world is on credit. I, I, I used to listen to Clark Howard quite a bit. I don't know if y'all know he is an economy guy, on a secular economy guy. But not only anymore, I'm, I'm on the last day and I'm cutting back on a lot of stuff and spending more time in the book. And, but I don't know how many people I heard call his show and say they were forty, fifty, and sixty thousand dollars in debt on their credit card and didn't know how in the world to pay it. Well, it's kind of like Dr. Wilkman told that one guy about his, uh, that told him about his wife and his life story and how sad it was. And he said, well, Doc says, what, a, what should I do? He says, you need to get a 44 Magnum, put it right up here, and pull the trigger. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Can he 
easily yeah. empty your bank yes. account. That's what that thing is talking yeah. about. Yeah. It well, can easily in, yeah. in that thing and put you in the red, and God wants yes. you to live in the black. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Amen. When I, when, I, when I left Pensacola in 1982, and, I, and, and Dan Gilbert, by the way, uh, somebody uh, mentioned him. I can't remember what that was. Somebody mentioned something that brought Dan Gilbert up tonight, but I don't remember what it was now. But, uh, Dan Gilbert had taken the church in, with nine people in it in Tahunga, California. Yeah. And I candidated in several churches, and uh, uh, nobody seemed interested in me, and I didn't know what to do, and I hated California. didn't want to come here and all that other stuff <laughs> you already know about. But he wrote me a letter and said, it's wide open. And I said, man, I'm going somewhere. I'm doing something. I said, Lord, if it's California, I'm going, and I, I left. And when I left in 1982, I didn't owe anybody anything. I only had a thousand dollars in my pocket. I had a 1972 car. I had a, a six by ten trailer with everything I owned in, in, in clothes and furniture, and that six by ten little trailer I pulled. And I had one other thing: a promise from my God that He'd take care of me. Yeah, amen. that's good. Amen. And he has done that. Mm -hmm. Amen. Folks, if God wants you to do something, he wants you to live in the black and trust him. Mm -hmm. trust amen. Him. Amen. Yeah. My aim was the ministry. Yours doesn't have to be the ministry, but your aim should be I want to live this life like yeah. you want me to live until yeah. you take me out of here. Amen. Amen. Right? amen. When I took Rough and Ready Baptist, and I saved that money and I lived off my savings and paid the mortgage of the church off. And as I said, I'm here tonight because of that, but that's not the only reason. When I was in PBI, a guy by the name of Gerald Sutek taught me how to wash windows. <laughs> I washed windows till I was 70 years old. Wow, wow, wow. I washed domestic windows. I'm, I'm trying to help you folks. Uh -huh. I'm talking about some housewives that's in good shape financially, who loves clean, clear <laughs> windows, <laughs> they'll pay you good money to wow. come in there and that's work around their furniture true, and their true. dogs and their cats and their lazy husband because he won't wash them. <laughs> I was thinking about this the other day and I said, Lord, should I tell them about the 28-foot ladder? Here I am, 70 years old. I'm climbing on the very end of a 28-foot ladder. And I'm on a, 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 a Victorian house. Oh, wow. And it's got a little peak with some windows up there about, well, not quite up to that glass, but close enough I can reach to it if I got on the very top step, top step of that 28-foot ladder wow. and got me an extension on my squeegee and my scrubber and got on my tiptoes and reached up there. Uh -huh. and I, the thing is, I looked down, that ladder had a two by four on one of the feet, and the other one was sitting on the ground. And I said, oh, Lord, that looks pretty rickety. Do you think I ought to tell these people to brag how I can tip, tip on my toes and get up there and, and 70 years old and clean that window and make good money? He said, yeah, but you've got to end it with, you dummy, I was right there in case you slipped and I was going to catch you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. I worked! Yeah, amen. I want to help people with money. I got money doesn't mean as much as it used to anymore, but I can't spend it fast enough now. If I could, I'd make more money. But I, I don't do it. But anyway, let's, okay. I, I, let me go over here. Psalm, Psalm 116 and verse number 6. Let me read you that. And then we're going to get to the last point here. And uh, I'll cut it short about 30 minutes on the last point. You can go sleep during the movie. Didn't you say that? <laughs>
Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why, I, why this, the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Now look at Exodus, back up to Exodus chapter 2 and verse 21. Exodus 2 and verse 21. And Moses was content to dwell with a man. And he gave Moses, Zipporah, his daughter. This is the first time that the word content shows up in a positive context. Uh, the back side of the desert is connected with contentment. A fellow by the name of Crew said this, contentment without external honor is humility. That's another bad little word, humility. Ain't little word actually. Well, see, the world's economy is generated by constant frustration of contentment. Moses was on the backside for 40 years. Nobody knew about him. Uh -huh. Knew nothing. Yeah. He just kept sheep. He was uh -huh. a nobody. But he was content. Yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. The ads that you see yeah. on your social media uh -huh. and every, all those That's other places great, are nothing but frustration of contentment. That's, That's real what good they are. Mm -hmm. They're designed to be that way. Mm -hmm. They're malicious. That's real good. They're aggressive. They're coming after you. And they, they get on us and they don't like us because we try to shove religion down their yeah. throat. But they sit there and they're aggressive. It frustrates them. They're malicious. They have no mercy. They're acts of war against contentment. That's real good. Yeah, yeah. Wow. My son works for the county, in Nevada County. There is a bus driver, a retired school teacher, public school teacher. He introduces himself as Ed D. He said, my real name was Edward, but war is terrible, so I dropped the W-A-R and it's Ed D. That's who's teaching your children that they're in the public school system. Wow. And deep. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Wow. Do you find it strange that Hollywood can make millions of dollars off of Bible doctrines that most Christians won't believe? Oh. <laughs> oh, you know, they do. It's the truth. Uh -huh. It's the truth. Oh, That's a very good point. There. Amen. You ever, you ever watch that movie, The Prince and the Whipping Boy? Hollywood made it. Huh. You need to get the thing and watch it. The Prince and the Whipping Boy. It's right out of the New Testament, the Gospels of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hollywood knows how to make money on it. All we know how to do is correct it and don't believe it. Correct. Or both. All right? <clears throat> you know that Hollywood put out a movie about an underground world? I watched the thing. Huh. I watched it. They believe there was an underground uh -huh. world. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <laughs> How many people in America do not believe that? Yeah, come on. How much money on them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Contentment. See, they're trying to make us discontent. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. Discontent. Look at Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. They, Hollywood knows these scriptures. I'm, I'm showing you two scriptures right here now that Hollywood knows. It's it's kind of like war. War is made by old gray-headed men in back rooms <laughs> who use dumb kids to go do it for them. <laughs> and you got Hollywood doing the same thing. Yeah. You got dumb kids making them a good living and they're supporting the people trying to find out how to make you live forever and long life uh -huh. and all that other. Here in uh, uh, Proverbs chapter, we're not 
Proverbs 20. 27. Proverbs 27. I, I, I believe it. I'm going to count every city there. I've got to find my place here. Yeah, uh, 27 20. And then we're going to go to Proverbs 30. 27 20. Listen to this. Hell and destruction are never full. They don't believe the first part, but guess what about the second part? So the eyes of man are never satisfied. That's how the ads are made up. Okay? Now, if, if you got a, 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 an iPhone or an Android, uh, yeah. Android or you buy off Amazon, uh, they'll get send you messages all the time about the they things will. we found that you need. Yeah. You need to read Henry and the Great Society. Okay? Uh, here we go. In chapter number 30, and chapter number 30, look at verse number 15. Hollywood knows these. The horse leech hath two daughters, crying, Give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things, say not, it is enough. And you can read the rest for yourself, but yeah. folks, yeah. Hollywood knows those things and they live by it. They take them literally and use them against you, Bible believers that are in debt, head over heels, yeah. and living in the rain. I remember I worked with a guy like that when I was working for BNK Construction. We were building paper machines. And, uh, I witnessed him and found that Neil was saved. And I said, well, <clears throat> how did you get by as a young teenage boy? He said, well, I had a dog. I had a 22 rifle. And I had a book, bunch of woods. And I stayed in there all the time and never even got in trouble. Wow. Of course, mm -hmm. you're living in Berkeley or you're uh -huh. living in Bay Area. That's kind of hard to find, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. is. Uh, when I first came to California, I, I carried a, a, a rifle in my gun rack in my pickup truck. You can't do that now to save your life. <laughs> Man, they're coming after you. You and I need to show the world that we're satisfied. Okay. Amen. We have a different economy. Yeah. It's an economy that we can live in no matter what happens around us. Mm -hmm. And it may be coming. I don't know that if it is or not. Mm -hmm. But I know one thing. We need to be ready. If it yeah, is. sure. And you're not yeah. going to make it otherwise. That's Father, good. I thank you, Lord, for showing this these things. And Lord, we're here to be a help. And Lord, to kind of look to the future. We don't know what it's going to hold. We know that, yep. uh, Lord, we're, we're on a teetering ladder. Lord, it's higher than 28 foot. Yeah. And we're on the tiptoes, and that thing is teetering, Lord. And you may not be there to catch it. So I pray, God, that you'll guide us and direct us, Lord, to live by this book mm -hmm. and be ready, Lord, and to uh, live a contented life and black ink. Mm -hmm. And, Lord, bountiful benevolence. Mm -hmm. Lord, we need to make friends of mammon. And help us to do that in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen and amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I know, but like Pastor Smith said, it may not be a shout message. You know, this is, uh, you've got to realize this, he preached something that uh, you wouldn't think that you would get from him, right? Right. You would know his style, right? You know <laughs> no, 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 I'm smart. I'm just smart. I'm just smart. Hey! Yeah, I'm something, boys. <laughs> We're going to give you a love offering up. <laughs> The thing is, though, is that some of you don't realize this. We, as uh, especially since you're part of the city here, it's very easy to go by the flow on how the world does things. Oh, right. you got to realize that some of the things you've heard also are a warning that if you don't follow can be sin even. Mm -hmm. Like discontentment, for example. You That's ever heard that? Yeah. But we're so used to the ways of the world that it's natural for us that uh, now uh, it's not just women, men get caught up by this too because we get caught with the eye thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. So when something pops up, the tendency is to buy. Right. Mm -hmm. That's true. We always wow. go by seeing. Uh -huh. wow. uh, my wife knows me because I think it's because I'm a pastor. When you're a pastor and you live single in the Bay Area when you're used to that, <laughs> and you're used to living PBI and being frugal, and when you got a dad who was CPA, you know, stuff <laughs> like that, I'm like super frugal with money, so when we do shopping, I'm like, she knows me. I'm like, no, no, we got to count how many items and it would add to this much, you know. <laughs> but you guys got to realize this is that we're so used to spending. 
Yeah. And uh, even that verse that you're not really thinking, but the world can sometimes, even though we're not supposed to follow the ways of the world, here's the sad truth is that sometimes the world saves more money than Christians save more Whoa. money. Whoa. That's Whoa. really bad. And wow. they don't know, like you said, how to use God's economy. So Christians, uh, you got to realize this, how I survived, and I've told you this stuff, and... You've heard me talk about some current events. Some, a lot of people know me that too. There's a reason for that. That's not our life ministry, but we have to learn how to survive. Right. That's how I survived. How I pastored here was to know this kind of stuff. Especially, as that verse said, you're supposed to be stewards. Yeah. Stewards of, it's God's money. Yeah. yeah. Right? It's not right. Caesar's. Yeah. It's God's. Amen. You have to render the things to Caesar's. I'm not saying being stupid with IRS. Okay, don't <laughs> quote me on that. All right? I, I've, I've been a good boy. All right? But the thing is, is that Jesus said, Jesus did not say render unto Caesar's the things that are Caesar's, period. Yeah. He said render unto Caesar's the things that are Caesar's and yeah. unto God the things that are God's. Yeah. Wow. So the thing is, is that as a pastor, I dealt with it. I found ways how we can save the money rather than using it. It's easy to just give it, especially if they ask it. But look, don't let them take advantage of God's money. You've got to be wise about that. All right? If there are any legal means and any right means to do it where you don't have to give God's money to the world, then by all means you got to do that or you're sinning against God. You have to realize that. So that's the bottom line from everything that you've heard. And you got to realize these are biblical characters who practice some of these precepts that didn't work. So sometimes you have to look at your heart. You have to, it's more of a hard thing. It's not, well, you know, I'm just, it's just how the world works and we spend the money. No, it's a heart issue. You're just lazy. You just don't want to do the work. You just want to follow the rest of the world. Or there's something in your flesh that you just can't satisfy. And it's just comfortable for you. Okay? So this is not a, a he. I mean, I didn't expect that from Pastor Smith either. Okay? But well, you got to realize that from this message, it's something that needs to be preached against that we didn't hear about. Right? Is that good. how are you using God's money? Oh, wow. That's and great. are you doing it the best Christian way and according to a biblical concept? Okay? Mm-hmm. All right. Amen. So uh, every head bow and every eye shut. What I want to do is this, is that because, um, you know, we're about to end the year, I want to give you time to commit to the Lord. Right? So the altar call is actually open. No piano. I want everyone to spend time committing to the Lord this year. All right? Sure. So, hey, uh, babe, it's from, you heard so many sermons. All right? Not just about money, but so many other sermons. But hey, maybe your issue is money too, huh? So maybe you need to surrender that to the Lord. You have a discontentment issue. You're used to going by credit and getting into building up debt more and more. You're used to be the type of person that just, uh, whatever somebody wants to get the money out of you, you just give. You're not using wisdom saving God's money. This is your life we're talking about. All right? Forget even being a saved Christian. All right? Even lost people know this is my life. I got to... Uh, learn how to save up, store up in the future, how I got to use it wisely. And as a pastor, this is undoubtable as a pastor. Every pastor has to know that. Every pastor has to know that. But you, you have a family. You got a wife. Husbands, you're supposed to be the one in charge of the whole house. And if you can't take care of that, you're an infidel, believe it or not. So you do have a responsibility. This year, let's, uh, let's commit ourselves to the Lord in everything that we've heard from the preaching. There's something that hits you. There's uh, a lot that what people said about falling to. We read it. It's uh, interesting what they said. You've got to find the right step. Don't start off on the wrong step.
That's why you can't get yourself back up. You gotta fight, not just say, I'm sorry. That's why you can't get yourself back up. And you gotta realize that God will never give up on you. And that's the reason why you keep repeating the cycle because you have a discouragement, I'm gonna mess up anyway, and you know, God's not gonna help me out with this one. No, God will never leave you nor forsake you. He will help you. You just gotta let him. As we start the new year, let's commit ourselves to the Lord in living spiritually. And that includes money-wise, too, because you never know what's going to happen. I've told this church something can happen really soon. And there's so many economists that say something bad's going to happen. And we have to be more wise than ever before on how we use God's money. Think about the future, what you're going to do for the Lord. Spiritually. And physically, you've heard both worlds today. Spiritually and physically, how well you're going to live for Him. And how you can make it a good year. This year was very fruitful, wasn't it, for this church? You know why? Both, both means. Both means. We thought about how to live it off spiritually and physically. Didn't the Bible say body, soul, and spirit all should be sanctified? Everything of ourselves we should commit to the Lord. Whatever you even physically eat, physically drink, physically do spiritually, do all to the glory of God. Let's think about how we can spend this year for Him. It's going to be a good year. It's going to be a good year because you got a good God. It doesn't have to be for the world. The world's going to be bad. Well, we already know that. It's going to get worse and worse, but not for you. God's going to be good to you. He'll take care, He'll take care of you. He, you've seen Him pull through time and time again. We went through hell. Yeah. We went through hell. But God has delivered you so many times. He'll be good to you. Let's, uh, let's make it another great year. But let us not be the ones ourselves to put the roadblock up huh? to prevent it from being a good year. The only thing that will prevent it from being a good year is not the devil's attack. It's not hard suffering. It's not, you can't blame it on the world or anything else. It's yourself. Yourself. So whatever you have these burdens or prisons, turn them over to the Lord. Whatever you thought about, maybe some of this stuff was eye-opening to you. You're like, I never thought of it that way. I've been living my life following the way of the world unconsciously. And maybe some of that was an eye-opener that I'm going to get myself together. I'm going to look at my family. I'm going to look at my money. I'm going to look at my own walk with the Lord, my spiritual relationship, my interactions with people around me. There are some things that God opened my eyes throughout these sermons. And let's surrender them to the Lord and commit. Father God, as we close in prayer, thank you so much for all these people that you've used to minister to us. I pray that we've got something good out of it and that uh, perhaps many of us will take in the messages in different ways too. That's very possible. But Heavenly Father, we all share the same Holy Spirit, and it's the same Holy Spirit that preached in all of these different preachers, Lord. And they all preached in different ways, but in the same Holy Spirit that will minister to us. Thank, uh, may it sink, may it connect in a way where we can co confess and repent and change of the right things in the right ways and start off in the right foot and give you greater glory. Bless us as we enjoy the remaining time of what's left over in this year give you the glory in 2023. Thank you, Lord. You've been so good to us. Amen. Even through the bad, you've been so good to us Amen. in 2022. Lord, you bonded us uh, and you blessed us in such a way that is beyond my comprehension. Bless the remaining time that we'll have together in the watch night tonight and tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's close the year. All right, is this still recording? All right, great. All right, let's close the year. Here we go.
Amen. Wouldn't it be great if the Lord came right now? We don't even have to go to 2023. Here we go. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. Yes, what a day, glorious day that will be. Oh, what a day that will be. Jesus, I shall see. Look upon his face. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow, yes, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. Woo! A glorious day that will be. Oh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Look upon his face. Save me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Verse 3, what's a Savior went away to prepare a place to stay? He is coming back someday to take his waiting bride away. And forever we will be with the one who died. Woo! What a day, day that will be. Oh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Look upon his face, save me by his grace when. What a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. <laughs> what, what a wise woman. She just did it like while we were holding the note. What is 37? Let's see. Yeah, she knows that. 37 is good. 37. All right, we have 10 minutes till midnight. Here we go. That might leave one more special for the last one. Let's see. I've kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. Woo! No sad goodbyes will there be spoken. Just a few more days. 
days to labor. Then I will take my heavenly flight. Yes, Beulah, oh, I'm longing for you. And someday on the One, page one? Oh, all right, page one. You're talking about majesty, right? All right, majesty. All right, so seven minutes till midnight. This doesn't have to be the last song, all right. And by the way, we are repeating majesty again, all right, so. <laughs> majesty, oh, our ship is majesty. On to Jesus. Be all glory, honor, and praise, oh, oh, majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise, so exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Jesus, magnify, come glorify, Christ Jesus the King, oh, oh majesty, worship his majesty, Jesus who died, now glorify, King of all kings, Jesus who died, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Repeat again, majesty. Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Oh, oh majesty. Worship his majesty. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Flow from his throne unto his own. His anthem reign. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Worship his majesty, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings, Jesus who died, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings, amen, all right, 74, all right. Calling out like immediately. <laughs> yeah, two minutes fast, it is. All right, four minutes. So 74 will probably be the last one then. All right, so 74, and then we'll all say Happy New Year, all right? All right, here we go. I have heard of a land. On the far away strand, tis a beautiful home of the soul. Built by Jesus on high, there we never shall die. Tis a land where we never go. Verse 2, in the 
that view their full home where we never more roam we shall be in the sweet by and by happy praise to the king who eternity sing tis a land where we never shall die never grow will blend with the loved ones who've gone on before. There's like 30 seconds, but yeah. So let's close it off. Um, go to Dr. Upman's song at the back page. Let's do that. And then after we sing that, we'll say Happy New Year to each other, all right? All right. So this is all a cappella. You ready, sister? All right, let's close it off. Uh, very much matches up with today, what he wrote. All right, here we go. <clears throat> What a day when I met Christ my Savior And he took away my sin and shame Back page! What a day when Jesus paid my ransom And he placed his spirit deep within Oh, uh, the world prepares to worship Satan and the nations fade and fall. I will rest and hope in Jesus' promise and will rise to meet him at his call. Verse 2, Christ the Lord is still my God and Savior, though my youth slowly passed away and he's still my constant guide and helper though I've sinned and often gone astray though the coming years may bring me pain and sorrow he will keep me all the way and I shall live to see his holy city, to shout and sing, oh, Savior, what a day. What a day, what a year. To your neighbor say, Happy New Year. Yeah.